Hi everyone, Woody here. Today we are continuing our Beyond Oil conversations with a look at electric vehicles. Are you ready to give up your petrol powered car or ute? What if you don't have a choice? Well, you can relax for now because as of today, I believe there are only around 13 all electric options available in Australia. So you may be safe cruising around in your V8 for a while yet, but petrol driven cars appear to be on notice all around the world. Now there is a, there's a great political will driving this development, but the tech going into um, electric vehicles, particularly from the point of view of battery storage, is advancing at an, a, a really rapid rate. And the range of these things is getting better as well, up over 500 kilometers mark, on, up over on the 500 kilometer mark on a single charge. Now is that enough to tempt you over, or will, it, will you wait until you have no other option than to go electric? Well. Helping me chew the, flat, uh, chew the fat on all this stuff is our resident, I say resident, he's over in the UK, <laughs> our tech expert, Sam Volkring, who is joining me on Zoom over in the UK. Sam, how's it going, mate? Good, thanks, Woody. Great to, great to be here, having a chat with you about uh, all things EV related and, uh, and what's happening. Well, if there's anyone that we should be asking, it's you, I think, because you've been covering this, this uh, trend for a long, long time. I remember we worked on a big report back in 2013 on the very topic. So let, let's sort of discuss where we come from. But first, first question I want to ask Sam, are, are Aussies, I mean, I, I, I don't know about the UK, but are Aussies really going to be able to give up their petrol cars and trucks without a fight? I mean, seems yeah. to be the mindset's pretty, a little step behind over here than anywhere else. Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, that's the sort of question that runs through my mind when, when I'm looking at the EV, I guess, market and, and how it's going to develop and how it's going to explode. You look at a place like Australia, and in that sense, Australia is very much like the uh, United States as well, because it, it's almost a part of the, the culture of, uh, you know, the gas guzzling V8 uh, engine, you know, internal combustion engines. It's, you know, the whole Ford V Holden uh, era and, and uh, V8 supercars, all that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's kind of a part of the Aussie heritage to to have a big stonking V8 ute parked in the garage next to the big stonking V8 4x4 or whatever. So you gotta you got to sort of think about what consumer behaviours are like when it comes to EVs uh, and whether that's going to shift in the way that we anticipate it will. And the short answer to that is that, yes, I think it absolutely will because... You know, one of the one of the big draw cards for EV development at the moment is the very quick pace at which range is extending, and importantly, the technology to recharge uh, the batteries that exist in these EVs. Because in Australia, where you know you, it's just this giant country where it takes forever to get from one place to another. I mean, like for example, um, my old man lives out in the country in country Victoria, and you know a three-hour drive from Melbourne to country Victoria is nothing for me. Um, but they're the kinds of distances that you know we have to be tackling. Um, and at the moment, you know, internal combustion engine cars will do. You know, some some really fuel-efficient ones will go close to a thousand-kilometer range. Mm. EVs need to be up to that standard or if they're not up to that standard, they need to be able to recharge in anywhere from sort of five to maybe 10, 15 minutes tops, um, which historically they've not been able to do. But that's changing. Uh, and, and as that changes, we'll find that EVs actually are better options than internal combustion engine cars for a range of factors. So once we knock off the range and once we knock off the charging infrastructure, there's really no reason why EVs aren't going to become the powertrain of choice for all cars on the roads in Australia. Is that the situation up there in the UK and in Europe then? Because they seem to, they seem to have adopted the idea of EVs. EVs. Uh, what's the saturation like over there? Are there, are, are there? are there major manufacturers all behind this, do you think? Yeah, so to give you an example, um, over the last, I think it was about over the last six months, pretty much since the start of the year, um, when you look at the sales of cars, and granted, you know, it's been a bit of a weird year, of course, with, with car sales and, and the car industry has been hit, but there are still, you know, plenty of opportunities before everything earlier in the year and, and at the moment to buy cars. And there's been a resurgence and spike in, in new car sales over here in the UK and in Europe. But there are only a handful of segments that saw actual growth in sales uh, compared to last year. 
and that's in pure electric vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, uh, and alternative fuel vehicles. The only categories of vehicles that were had seen a decrease in sales uh, were diesel and petrol cars. And every single major manufacturer, and that's not an exaggeration, every single manufacturer is developing a range of EVs and or shifting their entire development uh, of, of their cars to um, electric vehicles and alternative powertrains. So it's, the EV story is kind of one part of the equation here, but it's not, it's kind of not the silver bullet. When we talk about EVs, like we can pigeonhole into the idea of them just being pure electric cars, but there's also, you know, other options that are being developed like hydrogen power, particularly for larger long haul type vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, even trucks and, 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 and buses and all those sorts of other vehicles that exist on the road. Um, but looking at EVs, so, you know, one of the, one of the b biggest selling EVs in, in the UK and Europe is the MG, uh, I think it's the MG ZS. It's just a tiny, cheap, little um, sort of soft SUV um, that, that's made by, believe it or not, MG. And the old, the old uh, British mark MG was, it ended up getting bought out by a Chinese company um, yeah, and sure they've developed this super cheap SUV. Yeah, it's... And, and so everyone sort of thinks Tesla, 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 and it's like, no, nope. it's so Audi, uh, Mercedes, um, Renault, uh, Peugeot, all the, you know, French makers, um, BMW, uh, even, you know, even the American companies, Ford, GM, all of them are moving to EV. Um, and it's, it's not really a matter of if this transition's happening. It's just a matter of when it happens in particular reg regions. And so, like I said before, a lot of that just comes down to sort of three key factors, actually. Range, uh, ability to recharge, so charging infrastructure, and price. And, and price is already right now being sort of hit on the head. Um, and so the range is also very quickly extending. And it's just a matter of infrastructure rollout from here. You definitely see, you mentioned Tesla, you definitely see more Teslas on the road around Melbourne and Victoria. And I noticed the same thing even when um, we're on a recent trip before the lockdown started to Port Douglas, I saw a couple there. Um, but what, what's the time scale are we talking about, Sam? Like how long before, it's not just one or two you see, it's literally, they're predominantly what you see on the roads. So I think that's when it becomes a tangible thing, right? Yeah, so look, it's interesting, right? Because you notice a Tesla because you know that every Tesla is pure electric, right? But if you saw a all electric um, VW Golf drive past you and a you know a diesel powered VW Golf drive past you, on first glance, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and so I think a lot of people probably don't realize just how many are on the roads already um, because, and, and, and when, when they do hit the roads, when these new models do hit the roads, they're not going to look wildly different from the cars that we drive today. They're not going to be some sort of crazy futuristic, you know, it looks like it's got no wheels floating on the ground with nothing but blue LEDs all over. It's just going to look exactly like the cars that we drive today. Uh, an electric Ford F-150 is going to look exactly the same as a petrol powered Ford F-150. It's just that people see a Tesla and go, Ooh, that's a Tesla. That's an EV. Um, and so the the transition to uh, you know roads that are full of EVs is going to happen. It's it's already I mean it's already happening. There are EVs and, and hybrids and all, all over the shop, and you just don't notice them. Um, but you know BMW just released a whole new range of uh, you know their I think it was the iX3, which is basically a full EV version of their X3 model. Um, they're going to do that with the uh, X5s and a whole bunch of other range. Uh, models within their range there vw doing it across the board uh, daimler which is the parent company of obviously of mercedes they've they've pretty much put a halt to their internal combustion engine development and they're just moving to electrification across their entire range you know volvo are doing you know moving ahead quite fast with polestar which is a subsidiary of volvo and that will eventually roll out into volvos as well um, every single car maker is doing this. You could rock into your BMW dealership tomorrow, your Volvo dealership tomorrow, um, your Renault dealership tomorrow, and you could choose an EV to buy. And so once people sort of realize 
how much better that can be when when the infrastructure is there and in place. And I think that that's the key for Australia. The key for Australia is the understanding and knowledge that people can just plug it in at home, at, you know, whether once they've installed a, a charging wall box at home, can charge it up and, in, and, and go from home. Or if they're doing a long haul trip, if you're driving up the coast from Melbourne to Sydney or vice versa or whatever, that you can stop off at a BP um, or, a, or a Shell and you, you've got enough charging points that you can plug in and recharge, as I said, sort of anywhere from sort of five to 15 minutes so that you're not killing like an hour of your journey having to recharge on those long haul trips. Well, I was going to say, I was going to ask you about long, long journeys, actually, because Australia is a pretty big place. I mean, uh, you can fit, I don't know how many Britons you can fit in just Victoria oh, alone. But I think it's seven, given. actually, or something like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> and like, like you say, electric only of a certain reach. I think you said at the beginning, there's what what thirteen stations <laughs> in the whole country, so you can't exactly fill up quickly. How, how are so we kind of know the kind of infrastructure we need, but how are we going to overcome that problem? Yeah, I mean, so that's 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 the tricky part, and that's where you know. So there are regions like the US uh, moving really quickly with this, and I think the point with that is that it doesn't take a lot of time to actually roll out this infrastructure. And also, you know, we know that, you know, big, big, you know, historically um, you know, oil and gas companies like BHP, not BHP, sorry, BP, um, yeah. are, are partnering with, you know, major uh, infrastructure providers in different regions um, to roll out, you know, charging infrastructure at their stations. Because, you know the these companies that, that operate these service stations then you know they're not stupid they realize that you know the the profit centers for those service stations aren't necessarily the fuel it's the when the people go into the station and buy stuff and the different concessions and you know that's why companies like coca-cola and, and and pepsico and all those sorts of other companies invest so heavily in service stations because there's a whole another economy that goes on within that kind of infrastructure um, and so sort of within that they know that if they don't have these charging stations that one of their competitors is going to do it and that's going to draw a lot of that um, the, you know those potential customers away from their stations so you know you're going to find that over the next you know and it's going to happen quickly it's it's happened in in europe and the uk and the us where it's just been a matter of probably the last three years it's really ramped up um, and that's the kind of time scale that Australia should be really operating on because the technology is there um, and the companies to roll it out are there. And then it's literally just a matter of plonking them down and getting the right kinds of, um, I guess, infrastructure to those charging points. And I think the other thing that works in Australia's favour as well is that you can roll out a lot of alternative energy sources like, you know, solar uh, and wind to help generate electricity to help power those stations. So, there's a lot of little pieces to the puzzle when it comes to the infrastructure play and how it rolls out in Australia, but it can happen very, very quickly. And if we've got the, you know, the, the sheer volume of EVs coming to the market and then the infrastructure comes at a rapid pace, which it is, and the technology, as I said, is already there, um, then this isn't one of those in 10 years time stories, in 10 years time stories, always in 10 years time. It's a matter of like in the next... 24 to sort of 36 months this is going to really change the entire sort of fabric of, of car ownership and the kinds of cars that, that are operating on Australian roads yeah right so what, what's the what's the policy framework looking like to support that trend because I mean that that's a, a pretty ambitious I remember when we first started talking about this back in 2013 with the launch of your service here revolutionary tech investor and part of the part of the trend that we were looking at was the early move into EVs. You mentioned it's always ten years down the track. It, where where we are now is almost that, yeah. uh, but it's starting to really speed up. So, and I, I know the policy from governments and, and things like that. They're incentivizing industry to go that way. But will there be like incentives for say uh, EV car owners? Do you think like and will pet petrol powered cars be taxed more heavily? Do you think to dissuade people uh, from going that way? Yeah, I don't think there's going to necessarily be an abundance of incentives for people to buy EVs, mainly for the fact that the cost's going to come down anyway. Yeah, right. um, but what I think you're right is that there's going to be a almost a, a pecuniary penalty on 
diesel and petrol and internal combustion ownership. That's not to say they're going to be banned. However, there will be uh, a kibosh on the new sales of those cars. But, you know, if you, if you have a diesel and, you know, you want to hold it for the next 20 years, you'll probably be able to do so. But you'll probably end up just paying, uh, uh, you know, crap load more in, in road tax and, and, and insurance and all those sorts of things. Because, you know, the other thing that, that people forget about EVs is that they're, you know, mechanically less moving parts and they're actually easier to maintain than an internal combustion engine car. Um, so, you know, there are, there's, there's, there's something around the longevity issue uh, as well is that EVs will likely last longer, uh, than internal combustion engine cars anyway. So mm. there will be, the incentive will be to own EVs because if you don't, then you're going to be punished somewhat for not having them. That, that kind of, um, a policy though doesn't just flick a switch overnight. They, they usually give a bit of a runway because they don't, you know, the government, as, as, as rubbish as they are most of the time, they don't want to penalize people that have either just bought or have, you know, currently own those sorts of cars, but they want to make the, you know, the, a clear framework and, and, and everything that's gone on this year has accelerated that green transition, that green recovery. And over here, that's a slogan that they love banding about the green recovery about using new energy sources and new energy technologies to help, the economy, you know, bounce back from from the you know the storm that's been brewed up <laughs> from their own mess um, because of everything that's happened this year. So, you know, there's a really big push to to all new energy sources for generation, but then also obviously the EV story um, is a massive part of that, just because of how ingrained cars and 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 mobility is is in in our, in our society about how we get around, how we communicate. Well, how they're we they're integral to industry and, and the way businesses operate and do yeah. business. Yeah. And um, so yeah, I think that the policy framework has been there for a while, but it really takes industry and private enterprise to make it happen. Uh, and and it looks like that huge amounts of invest investment is is across the world. Car companies that this is what they're doing. But let's talk about the technology for one second. So t the battery technology, because that's pretty vital for, for, for this trend to take hold on a, on a practical level. So where do you see that going? Is it, is it really going to be possible to power your house from the excess ele electricity stored in your battery car, for example? Um, yeah, so it's, you know, that, that sort of thing is, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a life-changing sort of feature of what's possible, but it's possible that you can cycle the energy from your car to your house, your house to your car and so forth. You know, it, that's, that's not really a, a, a difficult thing to do when you've got your car plugged in at home. Um, mm. You know, cars as an, as an energy generation source, you know, we already know that, you know, there are these, on the market, you probably see them advertised in the marketing spiel everywhere, these self-charging hybrids that use, you know, different forms of energy recovery within um, the, the, the car itself to help generate energy for the car. So, you know, when, when it comes to the technology and the, uh, the, how it applies to things like range, then, you know, that's the, the speed at which that develops and even just the range of a single battery, you know, pushing out towards what an uh, internal combustion engine can do. Um, you know, Lucid Motors is a sort of new entrant to the market, which is really aiming bang at Tesla and, and trying to, you know, one up Tesla in pretty much every single spot that they can. Um, you know, the, as I said, it, it's not just an EV story. There's also, you know, hydrogen technologies, which are particularly applicable to heavy industries. So trucking, long haulage, things like um, buses, garbage trucks, that sort of really big, uh, heavy machinery, you know, the hydrogen story, there's also a really big part of, of that. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's even, even things like wireless charging, right? You know, there's a, there's a small company that operates out of Hallam called, um, I think it's called Lucid Freedom. Um, and they, they've just developed, you know, well, they're in the process of developing wireless charging um, just recently that their wireless charging mats have been rolled out with a new McLaren supercar but they're also rolling out wireless charging into things like car parks. So, you know, you might nick down a chatty to go shopping, um, park your EV just in a car park. But what's actually happening is that underneath um, embedded into the car park is a wireless charger that, that, that juices your car up. So, you know, it's going to get to a point where you almost don't even notice, um, you know, the, the range on, on most cars, 
because most people don't actually travel that far and that between home and the shops or dynamic wireless charging in the roads or that sort of infrastructure and technology that can roll out, um, range doesn't become an issue. It's only on those, you know, this, this idea of, of range anxiety is a bit of a fallacy because most people don't really travel more than a couple of hundred kilometers a week. Um, and so, you know, especially now, yeah, well, yeah, especially most people don't, don't travel at all. Um, so yeah. again, that opens up a whole new story about, about mobility and car ownership, um, sharing and subscription models for car, car companies, but all of those companies that are going down that model which is again we can probably talk about this for another hour or so um you know there it's all ev it's all these sort of skateboard um platforms that they use where you can sort of have this base platform of ev and pick up a you know a different kind of chassis and pop it on or you know almost mm -hmm. you know change them about so there's a lot happening in the automotive space about the technology around the incumbent car makers and what they're doing with their range, uh, the model range that they have. Um, and then all these new entrants that have come to market, and particularly over in the US, you know, you're looking at Lucid, you're looking at, you know, Neo's been around a little bit longer. Um, Fisker, Fisker's developing a car with a solar um, panel on its roof to help deliver energy to the car's systems. You know, there's a lot happening in this space, a lot of new entrants that, you know, some will, some will be fantastic, some will fail dismally. Um, but it's pushing forward the technology at a great rate of knots, um, which just reinforces how much of an opportunity this becomes, I think, for investors. I'm going to ask you about the kinds of opportunities for investors in a second. But first, I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, so you mentioned the supercar. It's just kind of, it kind of be weird to think watching the Formula One in, in, in Albert Park and just not hearing the cars just whiz by. That'd be strange. But um is that and is it in an just just finish one thing on the bigger picture? Is it an inevitable switch that we're going to be moving to this kind of thing? Oh, hello, cat. Um, uh, in Australia, or does the internal combustion engine does it have any kind of future? Is it, or is this it, Sam? Ah, uh, you know where the world is headed. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, look, the internal combustion engine. It's not. It's not just going to pack up and disappear in the next. You know two or three years. I mean, it'd be naive for me to think that in, in such a short space of time that EVs are just going to take over the market and that's it. Um, but, you know, the EV story, it, it's almost like it, it is a transition at the moment. And sorry, while well, my cat just annoys me. <laughs> like so the, it's, it's just this big transition, right? And what's happening right now in the EV space, um, it provides a viable alternative for people um, that are looking to get a new car. And, and I think that what's gonna happen is that you're just gonna see this transition, which is happening right now, and it's just gonna happen quickly. And so it's not, a, not necessarily a case of um, internal combustion engines just disappearing from the roads uh, altogether, but it's just gonna be, It'd be like it'd be like how LPG gas is an option for for power now, but no one really kind of has it. I mean, it's there, and people can sort of fill up with it if they want. And you know, some people swear by their LPG conversions on their cars, but it's a bit weird, isn't it? Really. Mm. <laughs> um, and it's just going to be. I don't think I've ever met anyone that uses it. To be honest. What's that? <clears throat> I said I don't think I've ever met anyone that uses it. But... <laughs> yeah, well, that's but that's right, you know. But it's there, you know. It exists because it it kind of is a thing. Um, and that's, look, that's going to be the same thing is, is you'll have, you know, the ability to recharge your EV with the plug. You'll have the option to, you know, fill up the, from the Bowser with hydrogen or, you know, over in the corner, there might be a single lonely double pump where one side's petrol and one side's diesel. And, you know, the people that take their cars over there have got these old classic diesels from you know 2015 that that you know, no one really drives anymore but you can still kind of fill up but you just get a bit of an evil eye from everyone at the uh electric and hydrogen charging points you know that that's the way it's going to transition just at the same way as that you've got petrol and diesel and you know the, the weirdos with the lpg over in the corner it's going to be the same electric and hydrogen the weirdos with the petrol and diesel over in the corner in the future well let, let's just finish up on that transition then so what kind of opportunity should investors be looking out for over the coming months and years to position themselves for this huge transitional change which is which is kind of happening before our very eyes 
should they be backing the manufacturers of these things or should is there some pick and shovel plays emerging or is it direct plays for the battery producers i mean what are your thoughts, Sam, on the investment opportunities? Well, that's the good thing about this is that there's a number of ways that you can play it. I think the one thing you probably want to avoid are the incumbents, you know, the big auto manufacturers. Uh, they've got, you know, there are, there are issues with them, with them just anyway, regardless of this transition to EVs. Mm-hmm. And even though they're developing a lot of EVs and they're going to sell a lot of EVs, you know, that's not really where the really big opportunities are going to exist. Um, you can play the manufacturer angle, though, with a lot of the new startup style companies or the new entrance to the market you know like i sort of mentioned before there are you know companies like fisker neo lucid um canoe a whole bunch of new entrants to that market uh you know there's going to be opportunities in that area there's going to be opportunities in the infrastructure side of things about those that are rolling out charging stations charging networks helping to provide the um, energy to those charging networks and stations uh, the technology itself, even things like, you know, the semiconductors and software that um, helps, you know, cars and infrastructure talk to each other and uh, operate effectively and efficiently. You know, f- for example, you know, Tesla increased the range of their um, Model S or Model 3 through an over-the-air update. So a software update helped I- increase the range of their their batteries. So, you know, there's there's a whole nother angle from the technology side of things through just even software plays um, and mm-hmm. semiconductor plays that, that a lot of people sort of miss when they think about this area of opportunity. And then of course, you know, the, there's the resources play about if we're going to have an entire world where, you know, mobility is, is now moved to, to electric and hydrogen power, um, there's, you know, the, the natural resources that have to go into that technology, into the batteries, into the way they're developed and manufactured and so there's a lot of there's a lot of resource plays that that tap that area as well so it's not just you know here's the silver bullet here's just one way to play this because there is only one way there's so many different facets when it comes to something you know a big story like an energy transition um Mm. that that makes it a really ripe area for investors to to you know get into some great investments and potentially make some you know great great returns from yeah, well, that's that's why I'm talking to everyone, and, and that's why it's such a, a fascinating area to 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 talk about and uncover. Well, I'm going to leave it there, Sam. Thanks for that. Uh, I'll be really interested to see how Australia copes with this transition over the coming years, and to see which manufacturers and other business will actually lead the way down here. There's certainly a gap to be filled. So, thanks for for lending us your your brain on the on on the matter and your breadth of no worries, knowledge, Sam. Mate. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, and take care. And uh, to those of you joining us, we'll be back with more in this series. Uh, Our goal is to bring as many voices on this topic together as possible and to give you as many ideas as we can about how you can invest in a world beyond oil. I'll see you again very soon.